Uh. It started with a statement of the native population. That's when they got their first taste in. They imported all the workers from the African shores. Rest assured, they inspired race hatred. Making up race, bad the drum and the bass. Black labor from the basis of a blood soaked nation. Soon 30 colonies turned an empire. Scots Irish on the front to the same Fast forward to the Spanish and American War. The first worldwide tour for our saviors. Now count in Mexico and trip. Welcome to One Dime Radio. I am here today with none other than Space Baby. He is a rapper, a hip-hop artist, a socialist hip-hop artist, and a YouTuber who makes some of the most insane hip-hop music with socialist politics. And I mean real socialist politics, you know, none of that fake woke bullshit. I highly recommend it. You can hear some of his crazy rap skills in the introduction song that I played in this podcast. Highly recommend you check out his content, and I'm so happy to be joined with him today because I've been a longtime admirer of his content. I really want to you know, ask all kinds of questions about how he learned to rap, uh, the importance of fusing hip-hop with socialist politics, the emancipatory potentials of hip-hop, and all of that. So we're going to get into all of that. But first, Space Baby, I'd like you to introduce yourself, uh, what you do, and where people can find your stuff. For sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really hyped about this uh, conversation today, which has actually been a year in the making. So uh, it's really happening today. Uh, So what's up, y'all? I'm Space Baby. Um, I'm a Maoist rapper, beat maker. And uh, even though I hate the label, I guess I can't escape it, uh, a YouTuber. And um, yeah, on my YouTube channel, I um, help popularize um, communist theory and history, uh, like I said, specifically from a Maoist perspective. And when it comes to music, I Trigger attempt warning. to do the same. <laughs> yes. Um, the anarchists out there. There we go. No, I got, I got love for my anarchist comrades. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, and when it comes to my music, I, I aim to do the same in a non-corny way, which I always emphasize because it's such a hard line to walk. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you mentioned the, uh, the the Maoist. You know, there's some people who might be listening to this show who probably see Maoist, you know, they get all scared by that. Um, mm. And although I don't identify really with Marxism, Leninism, Maoism myself, you know, it's a really highly misunderstood field of thought. We can get into that a little bit later. So but for those, you know, still skeptical, I highly encourage you to, you know, be open and also check out Space Baby's content because, you know, you'll not only get some dank hip hop music, we also probably get um, a little bit of a understanding of the point of view. Uh, as for Marxist theory, I'd highly recommend the series Marx in the House, which is about, um, say, on average, housing, gentrification, rent, issues like that. Really, really in-depth, really fantastic. But as for the hip hop goes, because I think that's what makes you especially unique. Uh, when I first was getting started on YouTube, because I was always into hip hop music and socialist politics, I was Googling to see if there was any YouTubers who had content that mixed, that did an analysis of hip hop using some kind of critical theory or socialist uh, a socialist lens. I didn't find many people, but I found your series, uh, a series you made analyzing capitalist ideology in hip hop. And I thought that was really interesting. And I also found your music in there highly recommend people check that out and i think that's what's unique now for those who don't know about hip-hop much but it started off as a really revolutionary genre or at least as far as music genres go and i talk about that in my most recent video called the culture industry how capitalism ruined hip-hop whereas it's it's hard to imagine that when you look at the state of hip-hop today but what got you into hip-hop and did it play a role somewhat in you getting into communist politics or do they, and what role do they have together for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I got into hip hop through my older brother uh, growing up in, uh, cause I'm, I was born and raised in the Netherlands and um, my brother was always, you know, would start to get into hip hop and he would play music really loudly in his room. And there was this one, like hot summer night, I couldn't sleep. And he was blasting Dr. Dre's 2001. Uh, and I just stayed up listening to it, you know, vicariously uh, through whatever filtered through the door. 
And that's um, when I fell in love. And I think hip hop was the first thing that I really completely dove into. You know, I, I have these periods where I really get into something and I study it. And I, this is the only thing I think about, read about, talk about. And that was hip hop for like a good seven or eight years of my life um, where I would really think and do nothing but, uh, but rap, make beats, um, learn more about it, study the styles of different artists. I would write, you know, 16 bars every day uh, to build up like a writing discipline. I was really, really into it. As far as um, what got me to rap personally, it was Public Enemy's album, It Takes a Nation of Millions. And, Amazing uh, you know, record. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, a lot of political themes on there. I think it always had me attuned to politics, uh, but nothing more than that. And I think that that is um, also a kind of a shortcoming of a lot of the, you know, I listen to the KRS-One, Tribe, Public Enemy, and they, you know, they, 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 they reference politics, but none of it is 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 absolutely or break breaks things down in a way that necessarily politicizes people i think it's more of a thing if you're already interested in it you'll catch a lot more see a lot more in it but it did make me attuned to the importance of politics um uh, and 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 really strengthened a lot of things that i was already attuned to such as, um, you know, racism, police violence, um, and all that stuff. But it was more when I then became a communist, uh, that's what I then really dove into in communist theory and, and, and reading and all this stuff. And it was only a year later that I was like, oh, I wonder how these two interests then intersect. Like it was a, it was a conscious effort that didn't automatically occur. And that's, and from that investigation came, uh, you know, the video series Marks on the Mic. Yeah, you mentioned something really interesting with the shortcomings often of political hip hop is uh, even in the days when hip hop was probably at its most political, you know, the 80s, late 80s and the 90s uh, with, with those rappers you mentioned, but also people like Nas, common uh, most deaf a lot of those greats you know and uh one of one of your um in one of your uh, older videos about ideology you critique how there's a lot of individualism in the so-called conscious rap t- of today like perfect example is the rapper joey badass with the lyric we can't change the world unless we change ourselves and it's like no <laughs> it just right. gets it entirely wrong and it um it misses the, the the whole societal aspect right the systemic critique uh, but i would say as far as a lot of the hip-hop goes there's there is that i guess you could say classism um that is missed the class analysis although there's some rappers i would say more in the underground who really really are cognizant of that like um akala uh moral technique I would say those are some of the best examples like Akala and um, uh, Immortal Technique. Uh, I can see for most deaf, just men- thinking of that, I can see a certain influence on um, on uh, your rapping style, which kind of brings me to a question I was going to ask uh, is, how did you actually learn how to rap? Because I can't emphasize this enough. It is hard to actually rap. It's one <laughs> thing to write. It's, w- good. it's one thing to, you know, write clever lyrics you know those rhyme schemes spiritual miracle lyrical whatever but like Mm. to fucking flow and to deliver is a skill that takes time and you do it like incredibly well uh artin was on yesterday on the podcast artin salimi another rapper um he was praising your ability he was like man space babies is just nice on the mic how did you learn how to rap and who are some of the rappers that influenced your style yeah um before I just want to clarify the shortcomings really quickly. I won't delve into it because I don't right, want go to for it. go again to this question. Uh, but yeah, when I, the shortcomings is 
rap music has always been really good in highlighting the systemic structures uh, that create the current material conditions. You know, like that has always been great. Um, uh, you know, from 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 a lot of rappers, it's really the step that comes after. What do you do about this? You know, because I was like, as even as a teenager, like, okay, I understand that all of this sucks, and uh, you know, all of this shit is fucked. Okay, I I, I understand. Uh, but then the part of what do you do about it? You know, I think that's the shortcoming, which is not inherent to to the rap music or shouldn't even come from rappers. That's more a, a, a shortcoming of the organized communist movement and the fact that rap arose um, out of, you know, a political vacuum, you know, uh, really gaining strength in the, in the late 70s when most... Um, you know, when 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 the communist movement in the U.S. Uh, was was really already steeply uh, into its decline. Um, so I just want to clarify that real quick. As far as uh, you know, learning how to rap goes. You know, first of all, I I appreciate uh, what you said um, about my style. It's something I've I've worked on for a very long time. I think the first thing is you know I've been rapping for. 15 years now uh, and have always been consistently uh, practicing it. Like I said before, when I was learning how to rap, I really made it a point to write 16 bars every day for years. Uh, I would um, look up like lyrics on AZ lyrics of artists like Cool G Rap and, um, um, you know, all these Rakim all these uh, legendary rappers, uh, also groups like Freestyle Fellowship, and I would just, you know, constantly rap along, uh, study their cadence, study their style. So it was really theory and practice, you know, I guess the the the, the songs was, was the theoretical platform and studying that and, and reading other people uh, write about it. And then the practice part, just rapping, 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 constantly, constantly, constantly sending it to people for feedback. How can I improve? Um, it was it was just this giant drive that I really found something very early on that I wanted to thrive in and and also it really being one of the few things I've always come back to because it's it's one of the few things that keeps me in the moment keeps me feeling alive so it's also there's this huge personal benefit to it in the sense that it's one of the few things that keeps me locked in the present and in touch with myself which has helped with continuing to practice it consistently yeah, I can tell, man, like there's ex there's some level of experience that just shows, uh, especially for anyone who's really listened to a lot of hip hop music. You can kind of tell, like, especially if you're, you know, a student of this game and uh, really listen to a lot of the greats in the past. You'll the, the people who are bad at rapping stand out. You know, you can tell immediately when someone is whack. And I think because. Now, I don't want to sound like a person who's like a hip hop purist and thinks that everything sucks now because there's tons of there's tons of good, great stuff now, like tons of great hip hop music. It's just not really so much in the mainstream. Um, but um, I would say there was a standard in the 90s that was a much, much higher before uh, you, you couldn't really pass being totally whack. You had to be certain you had a certain you had to have a certain degree of skill or else you just get laughed at. You know, you get clowned. Um, whereas now I think there's a lot of terrible shit that passes and because of low, the bar of skill in hip hop is just set so low. There's some rappers out there who's, who pass as like being really good when I think they're very subpar, like rappers who just rap really fast, but they don't really say anything, you know, that's a, or who, or who say might even have like a so-called conscious analysis, but are extremely shallow like someone like joiner lucas comes to mind like the epitome of or like hobson you know <laughs> someone who's like raps really fast but uh has like a extremely shallow lyrics but like to, to to people who you know haven't studied the greats they'll seem like gods you know but uh, i can like uh, no exaggeration uh, you're able to fit in the skills, the rhyme schemes, the flow, but the content. Like, I would just recommend, uh, you have a lot of great songs, but I would say my favorite is the newest one, the um, Fight Their Own Wars. 
because you pack in so much knowledge in that. I mean, it's just like the history of imperialism in a fucking song. It, that shit was powerful. And um, it reminded me a little bit of Immortal Technique kind of with his song, The Third World, one of my favorite rap songs. Did anybody like Immortal Technique or any other rappers, like certain ones um, influence you particularly stylistically? And uh, in addition to that is sort of an interconnected but separate question is, who are your top five all time favorites? Oh man, uh, <laughs> I hate that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not 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 because it's a bad question, but because I always start doubting myself. Like, oh shit, <laughs> who who is my top five? And it changes um, all the time. I am just gonna throw out some albums rather than artists that really taught me how to rap and that I sure. you know, modeled myself after, um, which is uh, Resurrection by Common. Oh, I love that. In terms of, so of work, yeah, it's amazing. In terms of work beats too, but I'll just I'll just speak to the to the rapping. Um, yeah, you know, the wordplay on that album, the 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 creativity, the switching up the flows and cadence. Um, I feel uh same thing about organized confusions. Um, man, their their first two albums, uh, and really again. Um, you know, especially Pharaoh Manch, just just the way that he, you know, what you said, like the gold standard, right? Like 92 and 94, there were so many dope rappers out there. How do you differentiate yourself from that? And I think Pharaoh Manch uh, at that, that time of his career is uh, really a peak example. Um, packing a lot of political content, a lot of social commentary, and just doing it, it stylistically in a way that had never been done before. The way he articulated and pronounced every syllable perfectly uh, to, 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 to match the rhythm of the beats as well it was a huge influence on me. I guess I've never really seen most deaf as that big of an influence, but maybe he is, especially on... The, the Black Star album, which is one of my uh, all-time favorites as well. It's amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, more in recent terms, uh, Bamboo is a really, really, has been a really big influence on me. Uh, ASAP Rocky, actually. <laughs> for Dude, the that guy has a good flow. For, People for hate the vibe on. that he brings. He has a great you know, flow. Yeah. He can just bring such a mood to the track and and the you know his the way he uses his flow to fit different beats especially really mainly his first mixtape which you know his his later stuff was unmatched to, to his first mixtape um, really that's a lot of people yeah. think the opposite like i would say the vibe of the first mixtapes is really unique but i would say for me my favorite album is the the ala one really yeah yeah that like one every... that one has a mate it's just like I felt like it, it had a really interesting vibe, but also his flows on that album were fucking smooth, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess like, he, I feel like he became, his stuff became more polished, like his rapping style as well as the sound. And I really loved that, you know, like all the, all the songs had like different mastering levels on the first fix tape. And it was like some True. of the mixes were like a mess. And I feel like that's where he... He he came out came out the best. Um, so yeah, really, there's 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 just there's a big, I, you know, cool cool G rap as well. His his early stuff with with DJ Polo. I feel like AC alone from Freestyle Fellowship. Really, anybody who experimented a lot with their flow and cadence and rhyme schemes um, were, were were people that really caught my attention and uh why really studied and I, I could still name like a million million more names at this point because i missed a lot of albums uh but i feel like that's kind of a snapshot of of the artists that i really studied i could definitely see like the a 90s influence in the the way you flow just because you have that classic type of flow if that makes sense and also you come up with really really crazy one-liners too like in that collab you did with artin salimi <laughs> I actually play that song very frequently just because the beat goes hard and the verses are crazy. The one where you kind of play as Lennon in the rap, you rap as Lennon and uh, Artin raps as Kotsky. 
I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, like so, so many great one-liners in there. Um, how did just uh, just rem- you just reminded me? Um, question I was going to ask initially is how did you get your rap name Space Baby? Where'd you get that from? So the whole thing about Space Baby is it's really. Um, I actually released this song years ago that was called Space Babies. Uh, and that was kind of this whole idea of alienation. You know, I would, it was, this was when I was a liberal. And it was the whole idea of like, oh, you know, there's people who are differently attuned, uh, who don't care about the things that society cares about, and they must be from outer space type of thing. You know, like this whole <laughs> thing of... I want to be separate from, I don't agree with society, thus I'm going to separate my society instead of I'm going to change society. Oh, uh, that sounds like, that, you know, all the, all the niche, all the niche academics who create a million variations of Marxism. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so that's where that came. That's where that name came from. It's like my fourth rap. I've changed my name a whole bunch of times, but I really, even after I became a communist, I was like, I still really like just the sound of it. Space baby, you know, it just sounds good. And even though I disagree with the concept behind it, um, you know, I don't know. There's, there's, uh, there's always shit you can make up about my name. So I guess next time I'll just answer that, you know, it's, it's to honor space communism uh, or whatever, but you know, the point of the, the point of the answer is it sounds good. And so I kept, yeah. Um, now we were just going talking about before the role of you know what hip hop can do, you know, in spreading consciousness, like it, what it could do if meshed with revolutionary politics. But um, I think before we have to get into the history a little bit. See, some might disagree, but I think there is like a clear decline in a sort of political consciousness. And a overall depoliticization of hip hop since probably the 2000s, I would say, maybe the late 90s, the shiny suit era, right when uh, hip hop started getting platformed on an MTV and um, record labels started throwing millions at it, and brand endorsements were all getting getting inside it. I think we saw a very strong shift towards materialism and a sort of get the bag men's mindset, right? I get the, I mean, the get the bag mindset was there before, but more from a different angle, right? Before it was kind of like a, a necessity, like a hustler's necessity, right? You can see that with Jay-Z's first album, probably reasonable doubt, but it more over time, you know, as record labels got really into this, um, there was, there was sort of a shift towards like a capital accumulation, you know, endless upward, growth you can see the the peak manifestation of late capitalism in hip hop's probably dj khaled right with the we the best number one you always have to be number one all the time you know um now there's of course still tons of rappers who have amazing content in the underground and there's even some on the mainstream who you know have great content like kendrick lamar but you know uh, as you said kind of only maybe hit the scratch the surface with some of the problems. What do you think has really, bro, well, first of all, do you even agree that there's been a decline in consciousness? Or I don't want to use the word consciousness. I would say uh, um, there's been a depoliticization of hip hop since, since the nineties. And why has that happened? I have my personal theory. I'll just inject that quick. Is I think neoliberalism, the culture of neoliberalism has a big role in that. And uh, not post 9-11 ideology. I definitely think that there has been a concerted effort to steer rap music in a different direction. I think the first thing is you can, there's always been great anti-capitalist or more political rap music made that has never stopped at any era. Uh but I, you know, I, I assume what, what, what you mean is what's in the mainstream. I think you mentioned yes, that, um, yeah. that there's like a mainstream underground distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like there's yeah. plenty of great stuff in the 2000s, but mostly right in right, the underground. Right, but in the mainstream, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, no, I definitely think that there has been a, a concerted um, effort that coincided with the lack of 
this political imagination, um, but also a lack of you, you, like the the far the further you go into starting from the late seventies to the to the nineties, you know, really again the 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 absolute almost destruction of the communist movement uh, in the U.S. at least. And um, uh, yeah, just just an almost complete victory. All the Panthers the, too, the I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that played a big role. Yeah, exactly. So um, you know, like up until the mid '80s, you have some you know different different guerrilla armed struggles going on in some places in the U.S. And then afterwards, that stopped. So you know, the the, the bourgeoisie completely having the the upper hand. Uh, completely dominating the uh, entertainment industry and then pushing for uh, the, 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 you know, the depoliticization or, or, or the more uh, strengthening of, of capitalism and glorifying capitalism has absolutely been uh, a concerted effort and a conscious push. Um, I don't think that I mean, that shouldn't be controversial. You know, we know that the U.S. propaganda machine does that to, 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 to everything. So why shouldn't it happen to, to rap? I think there is. I think there, there, there tends to be a combination of th- that, that that is accompanied by this aesthetic judgment. Uh, that that means that rap music got worse. I don't personally agree with that. I think that you had this different stylistic proliferation, uh, you know, starting from the the, the 2000s, late, I feel like just 97 to like 2000 is, I would say, <laughs> that, that to me was like a decline. Stylistic yeah, that was about to say, <laughs> that, you can't yeah. deny that, man. So to me, it's not like an aesthetic judgment, but um, yeah, a concerted effort to de- depoliticize uh, rap music, uh, absolutely. And has been done successfully as well. Uh, that, again, is not the fault of, of, of rappers or even the colonized masses. It's just a result of the complete, uh, of the failure of the U.S. communist movement. Do you think also a part of it has to do with um, ideology in general? Because I, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised by the lack of communist or or at least on the of even socialist or class politics in hip-hop music um and there has been a variety of so-called conscious rappers but as you mentioned a lot of them do fall totally short and i thought that was also very well exemplified with the no-name beef with j cole j cole is often associated with being a conscious rapper and i think in some interviews he might have even express some criticisms of capitalism very (laughs) very uh surface level criticisms but still nonetheless um but no name you know was heading in a much more radical direction i think probably just because she was you know like looking into all the history and stuff and all the revolutionary theory uh do you think though a part of it why it's uh there's of course the propaganda but i would say the ideology of individualism is a big role because th- we do see this proliferation of, you know, I, for lack of a better term, identity politics in the liberal sense, not intersectionality, but like in the liberal sense, that sort of posits that the solution is to have more, you know, black CEOs, more women CEOs, and all of that. And I think we can see a perfect example of that in the turn of Jay Z's music with um you know jay z is sort of like oh no we just need more like black billionaires like me black entrepreneurs you know that that becomes the sort of mindset as opposed to you know the economic dimension uh do you think a part of that is like just ideology because how i think that's it's not just that a lot of the rappers are scared to speak out i think a lot of them really believe like they they don't the idea of the question of communism doesn't even cross their mind and I think that's the ideology is that it's infiltrated everywhere. The immediate uh, reaction is just, you know, you need, yeah, like these sort of identity politics, capitalist solutions, these liberal solutions, where it kind of completely ignores 
colonialism and the economic conditions that still exist, right? That kind of impoverish mm -hmm. parts of the population. I don't know. That is kind of a bit of a long question, but I know you, you've explored this a lot in some of your older work about the role of ideology in hip hop. Mm -hmm. How strong of a role do you think that plays? Because I think that's often overlooked. It's a, it's a huge role. And I guess like I should have made that explicit. Uh, but when I say the failure of the left, uh, that is that is implicit in that, in that what it's it's the left, it's the organized left, it's the communists that circulate communist ideology that popularize communism with the masses. It's the Panthers, uh, and you know I guess to some maybe in some cities where they had uh, somewhat of a okay presence, the RCP, uh, and plenty of other leftist collectives who. Um, uh, who popularized leftism with 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 the oppressed masses, with the colonized masses, and that then of course is going to show up uh, in art. That's how it works. So the, the the predominant aspect has to be where where is the left at? Because spontaneously, you're always going to have people describing their material conditions. That is a spontaneous effect of class struggle. But when it comes to how they talk about it and what alternative is proposed in the art, the primary aspect determining that is where the left is at. And um, so that that the, the spreading of that communist ideology is something that the organized left does. And because hip hop arose out of that political vacuum, it was very prone to that ideological co-optation because it wasn't necessarily infused with some type of alternative. And it really kind of neatly follows, uh, you know, I've, doesn't David Harvey signal 73 as the starting year of neoliberalism? Uh, in his book, uh, I can't. I can't. I remember. think it's. I, I think it's seventy three or like seventy eight. Right, which is like you know seventy three, the year that also the first like Cool Herc's uh, hip hop party. So it it really neatly follows that that hip hop really arises in the start in the in the wakes. Uh, of neoliberalism. So I think that's why it was so easily co-opted uh, by this, this neoliberal ideology, uh, you know, had, had the height of the uh, Panthers, um, uh, had that been in the 90s, then rap music would have looked very, you know, incredibly differently. Uh, and that is uh, due to the counterbalance. And if there's no counterbalance, then music is going to take on uh, the dominant ideology. And in the 90s and further on, what is what has that dominant ideology been? Uh, neoliberalism. So uh, absolutely ideology uh, play, plays a major role in this. You know, one, one thing I think you're absolutely correct about is the the fact that there is no alternatives being pushed, like no real structural alternatives is a big downfall for why there hasn't really been a politicization or, um, or any effective change advocated uh, because we, we can see a lot of rappers, even on the mainstream who do sort of sometimes even call themselves socialists or will say radical things, but they don't really have any way of changing that or any suggestion or promoting an alternative. Like for example, Rings to mind is Nas has praised Fidel Castro multiple times in his music and, uh, you know, the Cuban struggle, but it um, doesn't really speak much politically other than that or any way forward. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big burden, but still, uh, as well as, you know, Ghostface, I think is Ghostface Killa has called himself uh, a socialist in his music before, too. We, we do see elements of that, but yeah, it doesn't really mean anything if there is no alternative. And one thing I was really surprised right. by was that even in, you know, the election, the election campaign of Bernie Sanders, who's like, you know, really a radical social Democrat, I would have thought at the very least, you would have seen a lot of big celebrities endorse him. I mean, not really many. I was surprised by the lack of rappers who even spoke at all about the election. Uh, there was some anti-Trump rhetoric, but that's about it. There wasn't really... I was surprised so much the fact that like no one, hardly anyone endorsed Bernie Sanders. And I think Lupe Fiasco, you know, is often, well, I would say, you know, extremely intelligent guy, extremely amazing rapper, one of my favorites, but he, he had an interview where he kind of 
expressed regret that he didn't speak about that enough himself. And he was like surprised that like no one in the hip hop community really endorsed Bernie Sanders. I mean, a few did, but that, that itself could have made a change, you know, it was like, yeah, Bernie Sanders, it's not like full commie. He's not a communist, but it's still at the very least it's popularizing just the discourse around socialism, which I thought was really important. And at least his victory could you know, set the stage for something else if that were ha- were to happen, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it, it was it was a shock moment when I saw that there was just hardly any discussion. I, it made me think, yeah, it's, it's depoliticization and it's the lack of any sort of alternative. But maybe there's also the class component, right? Is maybe on one hand, a lot of these rappers are comfy, you know, the way they are. So they don't feel, it's not, it's, they don't feel the same way they did when they were poor. So they don't really feel the obligation, you know, to seriously advocate for a change. It's one thing to signal, you know, mm. that you care. It's another to actually, because it's a, it's a risk, let's be honest. Like when No Name, when No Name uh, took the communist direction she did, she got a lot of hate. Mm. It's true, a lot of hate. Uh, yeah, so I, how do you sorry, suggest like people deal with that? Like rappers deal with that? Because I do see hip hop as a space that, it's kind of a tragedy that there's been this depoliticization because it's one of those movements that I think is the most one of the most transgressive and that could, you know, for lack of a better term, um, Trojan horse socialism. Right. In it. Well, I think I think it's like it it teaches us something and it teaches us that uh, that spontaneous music of the masses you know which which rap still is you know like there's a lot of co-optation but it's a lot of people who who have nothing and 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 who who express themselves and their voices the colonized masses in particular uh the new african masses in particular uh you know it's still it's still a type of mass music but you know what it teaches us is that spontaneously there's not gonna be uh a you know, it's not going to become a counter, like a counter hegemonic uh, uh, style of music or propaganda or expression or anything like that. That that comes from the the organized movement. I think one thing we can look at is in the Philippines. Um, you know, artists they join mass organizations. You know, like the on the national democratic level, you have. Um, a Bandai Sining, which is an organization uh, of artists that are tied to Anagbayan. So if you join uh, Bandai Sining, you automatically join Anagbayan, which is their youth organization, you know, and it's this, this in, there's, there's an integration set up in the movement for artists, you know, artists have to be embedded in the struggle. Uh, you know, artists, artists may experience the struggle, you know, um, but to be integrated in the movement against it uh, is, is something that needs to be set up uh, that I think a lot of revolutionary movements have not always consciously thought about how to incorporate artists. You know, I think a lot of revolutionaries talk about the necessity of art, the importance mm-hmm. of art, but there are not necessarily any organizational structures set up for it. And um, we're still in that way, you know, that that's where that's where we're still at. We just can't expect um, artists, especially what you said, artists who have become, you know, bourgeois, uh, Jay-Z by, buying fucking uh, $100 million paintings and all that stuff. We can't expect them <laughs> to speak for the masses, but I think even people who haven't uh, attained that level yet uh, for them to organically uh, be able to, to, to produce this uh, mass art that is also effective in, in, in organizing people and or to not necessarily organizing people but to further the struggle uh, is something that has to be consciously thought of uh, within the the context of a broader movement and until that happens we're going to continue seeing the same thing where you're going to have spontaneous class struggle showing up in songs in eclectic ways you know two lines that talk about how the CIA did this and did that, and then two lines that are super patriarchal. And then the next verse mm-hmm. is about um, 
how, uh, you know, drugs are destroying the community and all this stuff, but the answer is to open up more banks, you know, like all this, all this eclecticism is going to continue to, to, to show up. And I think the reason why rappers need to be organized and incorporated in mass movements is one that should happen to all artists, but two, that yeah, especially 100%. for the colonized masses. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know, art, art for especially for the colonized masses, rap is something that uh, ignites the hearts of mm-hmm. people, and anything that ignites the hearts of people is where where leftists should be uh, focused on, but also helping to guide and steer that, uh, you know, in in a mass line way, which, to put it very simply, uh, requires input from the masses and also leftists, not leftists telling the masses what to do, but also not leftists just following everything that the masses say, because that is somehow inherently correct. But to have this dynamic where one feeds off off the other. Yeah, like you said, uh, and you also have a video about this, that there's definitely a place for revolutionary art in kind of popularizing ideas. And many of the one thing I want to touch on is Unlike other types of music or most types of music, hip hop is specifically emerged from the oppressed, an oppressed class, right? And it kind of gives a voice to an oppressed class. And that's where I see it as that revolutionary potential, unlike a lot of, you know, like EDM, right? (laughs) Electronic music or um, pop music. It has that potential, like really untapped potential, I would say. with um with the ideology that's so pervasive it's it's no wonder that um people can't really think of many solutions because people will only people are only capable of what they have consumed right the people are really what they consume their information so if you know for so many years communist ideology has been obfuscated hidden in the background people aren't they can't really they're not going to think of anything outside of you know the liberal window the liberal overton window (laughs) i hate that term but let's we'll use that for this but there's so many i think it's a tragedy that we have a culture of depoliticization in general uh i know there's there's this term you know you can't speak about politics with your family don't talk politics don't talk religion don't talk about this and it's it's almost it's a taboo to even try to bring you to to try to put your friends on to some kind of politics, your family on. I think we should be doing that. We shouldn't, we have this liberal ideology, especially in Western countries like the United States, Canada, and Britain, that it's, I agree. I have my opinion. They have their opinion. We should just keep it like that. No debate, you know, and it's, it's really stupid. And it's really, it's a problem because you, it really hinders the spreading of ideas I've always thought to myself, there's plenty of rappers, if they just encountered certain Marxist ideas or certain little aspects of history, they could get radicalized instantly just because they have, there's a lot of rappers that come to mind that are very, very intelligent and will often like hit, they'll, they'll hit the surface on certain problems, like whether it be for their music or the interviews, but they'll kind of miss the larger picture. Uh, there's a couple that come to mind for me is like, you know, Vince Staples is someone who seems to be very cognizant. Uh, the rapper Vince Staples have a lot of like problems of materialism, of um, the culture of accumulation. But, you know, it still misses the bigger picture. Say that with uh, Gam- Childish Gambino, too. Always, someone who always seemed very intelligent, but misses that bigger picture, right? Only scratches the surface. Uh, Earl Sweatshirt, someone like that. A lot of in- intelligent people seem to like, get the problem kind of but they don't get the root causes and because they don't know the root causes and the structural aspect of it they can't really find a solution and it's it would be really great i think if uh this area was more for lack of a better term you know to use the gramscian term a long march to the institutions and i think one of those uh that should also include artistic spaces like hip hop, you know, it's where Marxists can spread influence. And uh, I'm really happy to see the rise of people like uh, the, the, the shift rather in people like no name who've 
who spread what they learn on Twitter and stuff like that. I really wish it was more of that. Um, what strategies do you think that maybe Marxist influencers or organizers, revolutionaries, as well as artists, political artists can do to kind of help push hip hop more? It's a question I have trouble with. Yeah, I think I think what we really should be focused on focusing on is the next generation of of rappers. You know, I think when okay, yeah, when it comes to artists like Vince Staples and Childish Gambino and all these MCs, I agree. Have they in their youth uh, been involved with mass organizations uh, that popularize communist ideology, uh, then that would have been great, you know? And they have obviously the stylistic skills to um, uh, to help popularize that message and make great music and put that in their music, the, the, the Trojan horse uh, style that you, you'd said before. So I think what we really should be focusing on is this, this next generation of artists, you know? Uh, they're right now not involved in any uh, politics, probably because there's not a proliferation of uh, mass orgs, uh, you know, that are guided by revolutionaries. Uh, let's say in in five years, uh, you know, if you have in every major city, you have this broader organized uh, leftist movement that has mass orgs that are actually ingrained. Uh, with the with with the masses, then you're going to have kids that are involved with that, and some of those kids are going to want to rap, and you know they already will have that political uh, influence. And um, if we have mass organizations that are tied to the arts, um, that uh, again are uh, of co- you know have a communist ideology, then people who want to rap will flock to those uh, already as well, and from there on, you have a domino effect. So I think the the, the primary question is tied to what organization is being done, how are neighborhoods being organized uh, on the local level, and how uh, is the next generation of artists uh, work with, you know, that are that, that are going to come up, how uh, how are we guiding and helping to support and foment the production of a mass art that is both a genuine expression of the masses of their uh, material conditions, but is also guided by a larger strategy and communist ideology. That to me is the more important and pressing questions than how we can help facilitate already established artists to take a more radical approach, uh, which is uh, Mm. much more difficult. And I also do not necessarily have an answer for right now. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The next generation of not just rappers, but of, you know, the youth in in general is obviously important, right. To, um, Spread consciousness to, and you mentioned mass organizations uh, that that can especially be important for you know local communities, people who are rappers who are known just in their cities and their local areas. And you can, I mean, it's not just for rap. Yeah, obviously, mass organization just has its, it has its has its uh, role in so many aspects of just you know, organizing workers, right? But I would say there's the other factor of it is a lot of people get their information online. You know, everything's online these days. Uh, so many people even get radicalized online. A lot of the Marxists I know are like radicalized online for better or for worse, right? Often for worse, but I mean, it's better than nothing, right? Uh, you see a lot of, it's just a space that I think is is so vital. It's where so much of ideology spreads now, um, especially on the right, but now on the left as well. And I think we need to utilize those platforms too. You know, I, I get the... Um, mass organization and the direct action but there is a tendency among marxists i notice sometimes it's to kind of retreat from the online world and to think that the online world's not important and it's just you know quote unquote real life but i will i like to use the term from the theorist jean baudrillard is nowadays the map comes before the territory so simulated our world is and i think we have to use that you know we have to adapt to that to a certain extent 
and maybe find mediums of that's why I, I would say is if we had a generation of rappers who you know did have that Marxist consciousness, you could spread it so exponentially because with online you influence people everywhere. You influence people not just in your community but uh, all across the world. Often, it, it's um, so. So I see that it is vitally important. Um, I'm not sure how you know to go about this because obviously I'm not a rapper myself. How would you suggest we adapt to these platforms? You know, spread ideology. Because obviously, you know, we can't we can't just do what the Trotskyists do, okay? We can't just, you know, give newspapers right. <laughs> to people. Like, oh, th- there has to be, like, these new tactics. And I see that as important and frequently lacking because, you know, there's a lot of organizations one will join and you'll see just a bunch of crusty Marxists in their 50s who, like, are very out of touch. And uh, I think, you know, that that that's something that, that needs to be discussed more, you know? I, I really think uh, these platforms can't be abandoned. We need to use them. I emphasize that a lot in my videos, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, uh, you know, the online aspect is important. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, you know, I've been making YouTube videos for four years. So, um, of course, I, I think that that dimension of the struggle uh, is important. There's both an overemphasis on online content and underemphasis um, on it. It's really a tool. Um, and again, I think uh, what's interesting is from the ongoing revolutions, you know, ongoing right now, uh, it is the, you know, the struggle in the Philippines where they use the internet a lot and they use social media uh, a lot. Uh, because yeah, again, that's where people are uh, congregated at, and there are a lot of uses uh, of the internet that you know uh, I won't get into right now, but I think people can guess uh, for revolutionary purposes. I think what the problem is is that, like so many things, the internet is being used as an individualistic tool. When it comes to online content, it is individuals that tend to make better content than organizations. And I think that's a problem and not anything that's inherent. You know, like we're, we're putting forward political lines, um, uh, theory, histories, you know, certain, certain, you know, interpretations of history, certain interpretations of theory. And I think it would be good and we would all benefit from it as a movement if that takes place uh, on an organized level, that instead of uh, all these YouTube channels, uh, uh, you know, from from individuals that there are organizations behind them and that they are organizations like there, there, there should be Mm -hmm. no reason for a strong local organization to also make really dope content and put that online, right? It doesn't happen, yeah. but there's I've nothing saying, inherently in that uh, why that doesn't happen. So I think to me, that is more the critique. And again, you know, I'm an individual making YouTube videos and I've been trying to get more people uh, on the channel that have the same political line uh, for, for, for a long time, which has proven to be a difficult task because of the level of organization, um, you know, especially of the, the Maoist movement uh, in the U.S., but I do think that that should be the goal and is the shortcoming right now. And I do have, I have also seen uh, people kind of completely negating uh, the online aspect um, rather than highlighting the useful terms of it. I just think that right now, again, it is too much based on individualism rather than collective efforts. Yeah. I've been saying we need like a communist Prager U like a, a crowdfunded, well, like a well-produced organization that has like some really good content that can educate people in very accessible ways. Uh, that's lacking. And the social media game of so many communist parties is just terrible. Even I think just rhetorically, you know, this is the thing where I break actually from a lot of not just the Marxist Lenin, but Marxists in general is this is a whole other debate is I think a lot of terminology we use is outdated and we could literally mean the same thing if we just use different words like, you know, um, 
proletariat, right? Um, dictatorship of the proletariat, like a word I never recommend any communists ever use. They want to actually, you know, persuade non-communists to the, to the line. It's just, you know, we could, you, you, we can just shift the lines. I think there's a lot to, to learn from the right. You know, the right don't, you know, obviously the right parasitic ideas, like it's no way in, in compar- comparable ideal wise to the left. But you see like tons of fascists nowadays, they don't, they hide their power levels, so to speak. And I think there's something to learn about that. You know, like they, they don't, they don't run around with the same uniforms as before. They kind of, they kind of wear, they wear suits, you know, they, they, they do this whole new strategy. And like, I like to say is the Marxist method is to analyze different economic conditions of societies, but I think there's also the societal component. Right. I had this conversation on Paul Morin when I went on his podcast or Marxist Paul, the channel. And I talked about we were talking about the hammer and sickle. And in some countries, that is actually a symbol that can be very effective because it's still a lot of people still have the it's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of working power. But in a lot of other countries, it just seems kind of like outdated or it brings very negative associations and it's often unhelpful. Right. Uh, the hammer and sickle. So I think, you know, there is that like difference from different cultures and how to adapt to that. But like, anyways, like, like you said, with the mass organization, that would really help instead of just being individuals. Like we, uh, I, I really advocate also for think tanks. That's the thing which helped popularize uh, the neo, the neoliberal ideology a lot is think tanks can be really good uh, and organized way of disseminating information. Now, before I getting too deep into that, I wanted to ask you what got you into communism and specifically Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Tell us about how you got into that and what your case for it is and where people can learn and where people can learn. Marxism, Leninism, Maoism or Maoism for short is uh, the current high stage of revolutionary theory and practice. And it takes all the experiences of uh, past revolutions uh, and, uh, and applies it in a, in a new framework. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, Paris Commune, uh, the Soviet Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and then particularly the Cultural Revolution uh, within the, the Chinese Revolution. And you can kind of break it down in a couple of tenets. The first one is that the way to organize is by using the mass line, which is not being commandist, aka not telling people what to do and not being tailist, meaning not just following everything that people say, but the mass line, meaning you start from the ideas of the masses, uh, take the most advanced, filter that through a revolutionary framework uh, and uh, give that back in the political line. So it's a back and forth. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is the necess- necessity of the co- of a cultural revolution, which means that because uh, the party, the communist party, which is necessary for making revolution is a microcosm of society, essentially, you have class struggle taking place uh, within uh, the party. So there's always going to be a bourgeois faction and a proletarian faction. And the way to combat that is uh, through rectification movements, crit, self-crit, and uh, cultural revolution. And um, um, you have uh, the other aspect is uh, class struggle continues under socialism. So, you know, Stalin famously said that after the revolution, you know, there's no more class struggle. It's just a continuation deepening in class struggle. And, um, you know, the Chinese revolution, the Soviet revolution and the Chinese revolution has showed us that, no, there's still there's still plenty of class struggle. Even after the capture of state power, uh, it even intensifies. Um, And the other uh, theories, uh, more military strategy, which is a protracted people's war. And I'd say that those four aspects are the most important uh, tenets of Maoism today. Yeah, I have, I have my qualms with some of those ideas, but uh, we could save that maybe for another podcast, actually. <laughs> that sounds uh, good. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm here for it to talk. Yeah, about I have, a lot, of, I have a, lot of, a lot of qualms with uh, some of them, but I just, just because I don't really agree on some of the interpretations of history or whether, let's just say, cultural revolution really succeeded in its aims. Hmm. Um, but um, anyhow, 
where would you suggest people want who want to you know learn about this? Because one thing I always encourage is whether one disagrees or agrees, they should always learn about what they're criticizing. Because mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who don't really look into stuff and they'll have a caricature and they'll usually their critique will be bad. And what this does is actually reinforces the other person. Like, for example, I think a lot of a lot of the critiques. See, I think there are many good critiques of Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism, but there is a lot of terrible critiques, and as a result, it kind of reinforces the people on that end. And it, uh, like, there's people who have like really stupid caricatures of it. So, but, so where would you suggest that people who want to learn about this should learn? Like, what what are good yeah. resources? No, for sure. Um, Four languages press is a, a Maoist publishing house. Uh, that um, so the, the the recommendations you can find you can buy through there, but also they offer free PDFs uh, of these works. Uh, so if you just Google foreign languages press uh, or even the title of these books and uh, and PDF, you will find it all uh, online um, for free. The PDFs are free. I would really recommend um, reading activist study guide. Um, from the from from the Philippines uh, that really go into what Maoist organizing is. Um, I would recommend rethinking socialism, which um, is about the history of the Chinese Revolution as well as what the Maoist conception of socialism even is, because you know there's a lot of different interpretations of of what socialism is. And then for more um, like in-depth analysis of what Maoism is, I still think that uh, uh, Continuity and Rupture by JMP. Yeah, uh, I know that, yeah, I think that that one is still good. So I would I would I would recommend reading those three texts. Uh, starting definitely starting with the activist study guide. Uh, now I would throw in my recommendation too is. For foreign language press, they have really good podcasts, uh, like lecture series kind of podcast. They have like a whole Marxism, Leninism, Maoism uh, series that's pretty accessible for those who, you know, find reading difficult. Uh, those can be pretty good. Uh, so I'd recommend that, you know, always, always learn about all the tendencies. That's where I fucking always like to advocate for anyone learning. Is uh, So yeah. And, um, but yeah, one thing I would say is, big lesson in all of this is that now people can talk revolution they can talk activism direct action or even on the moderate end electoralism to me i don't think any of them really can have a huge impact without numbers any socialist movement needs numbers and to get numbers you need various tactics of mobilization so that includes you know mass line like you suggested you know, real interactions with communities, as well as, uh, for lack of a better term, propaganda. That's really vital in any sort of movement because you need to, to understand why anyone should go about, for, for anyone to see why they should go about socialism, they have to understand the structural problems of capitalism. And then there's the other step. People who often go from there, they stay, they stay at a social democratic reformist conclusion to understand Why to go beyond that, you have to look at why that falls short. So I think there's all many layers of propaganda that um, need to happen. Because frankly, this is where my thing with uh, different countries have different are in different uh, stages of revolution, right? Philippines in a very different situation than the United States. So something like protracted people's war, I think, would be absolutely disastrous in the United States at least now, with the level of, you know, lack of consciousness, because frankly, I think if uh, even if protected people's war got big enough to have an impact, I think a large majority of the population might even support a fascist dictatorship to crush it, or, you know, just use the system they have now to crush it. Um, So it's, it's, I think you just, we need numbers, simple as that, Uh, numbers, and the best way to do that, well, are using a variety of tactics. And um, one thing I wish is that the artistic spaces where the most oppressed people are at are very important because those are the people who most who have the most to gain from these movements, right? So um, 
that's the importance of hip hop, you know, and that's also why I had you on today. Um, but yeah, I'm running out of time a little bit here, but it was amazing having you on. Thank you so much uh, for going on the show. I really encourage my listeners to really check out uh, Space Baby's art. It's fantastic. His uh, music is top tier. Yeah, I appreciate it. This was this was a lot of fun. And yes, let's definitely have me on again so we can talk more deeply about about Maoism because I was already like, okay, there's a lot of things <laughs> there that I wanted to oh, respond yeah. to. But let's definitely save that for next time. Um, and yeah, you know, I would um, if you want to check out my music, uh, if you type in Space Baby on uh, all streaming platforms, you'll find it. Uh, my uh, latest song is uh, called Fight Their Own Wars, which is about um, the history of U.S. imperialism in three minutes, uh, listing uh, all the invasions, or at least as many as I can. And uh, my last mixtape was uh, called uh, Space Babies Volume 1, which features a lot of the themes that me and One Dime talked about today. So if you enjoy this content and want to help out, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Other patron tiers get access to things like exclusive podcasts and my Patreon book club. Uh, one class rules the state. Only one class dictates the day to day. What the fuck is pre-socialist democracy? Using empty words while the people need honesty. Power to the Soviets. The people had the goals met. Pay with blood as they own debt. You want peace, but really that's a trick. To put an end to the rise of the Bolsheviks. Fuck your renegades, get to get your ass beat. So you told the line of Kerensky. Know damn well what class it is. You're nothing but a PB nationalist.